Mike that are sitting in, Omega Cinema Props. Shout out to them, as well as Matt Patrick. Okay, that's not very roasty. So let's <laughs> get on with it. How are you, Michael? I'm very good notes, thank you. <laughs> no fucking change there. <laughs> my pal, my lineman. Uh, they say, how are you doing? I say, better, I'm better than most. You want to try me? <laughs> uh, every once in a while, a young lady would say, yeah. And they go, hala, 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 hala. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, Michael, but this is my time to roast you, you fuck. <laughs> Say about that. <laughs> Never shuts his fucking mouth. <laughs> anyway, look at you. You look like the poster boy for stop fucking everything that moves. <laughs> I want to tell you a little story that about three weeks ago, Michael generously took a trip out to my wife, Siobhan and mine, our home in Mar Vista. And since then, not one of the fucking squirrels has picked up a nut to save for the winter. They'll be dead by fucking Christmas. He's a dirty man. You know what I'm saying? He's a horrible, dirty man. My wife said, what are you going to say? I said, I don't know. Well, can you imagine something funny? I said, well, all I can think of is that Michael reminds me of the kind of man who's bitten by a zombie crossed with a, with a dog in heat. <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine, but... Comedy Central, I've looked at YouTube as I'm sure we all have. And honestly, I mean, the people that they put in these kind of thrones, they're real celebrities. You know, they've, they've had an incredible career, they've worked really hard, they have a lot of really important friends, they're in good health. They're not broke and lonely and cancerous. <laughs> Degenerate, can I say that? Degenerate? Uh, <laughs> <that's it. laughs> anyway, let me go back to meeting notes. Uh, so, considering that I have studied, there are three rules. People probably there's no rules to roasting, but there are three. The first of which, number one, Making the roasty, roasty as uncomfortable as possible. Okay, well thank you, Cancer. You don't know. <laughs> you took the card right out of my deck. Uh, keep keep playing on that one. Keep playing, Michael. Keep back. trying. <laughs> Number two. Michael will keep his fucking mouth shut. <laughs> Roasty, Roasty's choice of charity to donate to whomever they wish. Which is fantastic in this case, as Michael is his own charity and always was. <laughs> Number three. Nothing is too sacred to make fun of. Actually, Michael, um, I didn't want to say this, but uh, a little while earlier we did get a call in the theatre from God himself. He did say... You have not too far to go, but don't worry. Um, you're going to live eternity just as you lived your life. Oh, shit. <laughs> I did have a punchline for that, but I don't fucking need it now. <laughs> anyway, so about... Uh, what you probably don't know is that I am actually the, the second choice for this evening. I wasn't the first choice, it's fine. Cat, um, <laughs> as you know well, worked very hard to get Michael Douglas in here tonight. Um, he couldn't make it, unfortunately. He has a tickly throat. <laughs> <laughs> and now what's 
funny is that I, in my in my mind I feel that he is a he's a much better choice than me. He's got more in common with Michael. Years ago, the two of them took a voice class together, which is very interesting. What was it? How to be a good cunny linguist? Was that what it was? Yeah, that's right. Um, and as it turns out, actually, you have more in common than you think. Now to get to the serious part of the evening. Um, you're not actually here for a roast or for a charitable thing, and it looks good and all. Um, let me fill you on some stats. Of the 14,000 throat cancers diagnosed each year, 70% of them are related to HPV. <laughs> and in turn... And in turn, found in cervical and anal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, what you're actually here for is for a questionnaire. <laughs> um, I will need you to raise your hand to answer each individual question. Please take your time to consider what they are. Number one. Anyone received a hand job from Michael with visual sores, cuts, or scabs? <laughs> we have one, two, three, four, five, six, Michael. Did that sound right? Seven, seven. That was a great afternoon, John. <laughs> these blood-drenched, sensitive teeth. <laughs> Anyone? We've got one here, two again. Oh, good man! You've got one on two. Three! We have three, four! Four? That's it? Okay, let's move steadily on to number three. Anyone throwing their legs over Michael's shoulders and let him wear them like a feed bag? Anyone here? Anyone have a couple? One, two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one more question. Anyone in this room ever served a drink by Michael O'Dwyer? Hands up. Well, as it turns out, Michael is consistent that one thing in life and one thing only. He always dipped his balls in every drink he ever served. So I guess we're all fucked. That's enough for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to our roasters for this evening. First man up is a dear, dear friend of mine. I think he's the eighth wonder of the world because he's such a hairy bastard. Uh, he is uh, what I call Bigfoot's mini me. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jeff Perry. Um, I want, wanted to uh, start off the night honoring Michael by talking about um, his role as a caregiver. <laughs> he's, uh, he's always taking care of us. He's always, you know, kind of looked after us all. And uh, I can't tell you how many times when working at the bar, somebody would approach at the bar, a couple would approach the bar, they'd sit down at the bar and they'd look at me with these big eyes and they'd say, is Michael working tonight? And I'd say, uh, no, actually, he, he works on Monday night, he works on Wednesday night, he works on Friday. This is our first time being back to Tom Bergen's in 102 years. And, and Michael introduced us to each other. <clears throat> and it was, it was a busy, busy night, and I was feeling glum, and I was in the corner, and Archibald here was feeling glum. <laughs> He was in the opposite corner, and Michael introduced us, and we've flown all the way from from Copenhagen to tell him that we've been married for 101 years, because all because of him. And uh, and I get this all the time, and I say, "Well, that's that's great. That's really great." And um, and I'm just I'm 
glad, which is great, you know, because I'm glad Michael has this ability to be the kind of the matchmaker because, um, you know, in the nine years that I've bartended with him, I've never seen him, you know, kind of get any ass of his own. <laughs> But on a more on a more personal note, um, um, you know, Michael, he's always taken me under his wing. He's always kind of shown me the ropes, and and you know, it's I, for a long time I had the Sunday day shift, and um, which would end at 5:30, and Michael's night shift would start at 5:30, and much to my colleagues and my management's chagrin, I used to love to play hockey on Sunday nights at <laughs> six. So I'd leave at 5:30 and be like. You know, I gotta, I gotta go. Oh, and so like side work was like secondary, and everyone's like, Jeff, what are you fucking? And Mike would come in. And Michael would come in at 5:30 and be like, What are you doing here? I'd be like, I know, I'm trying to go. He's like, Get up, go, get, I got it, do it, go, go play hockey. It was really nice. And then uh, one, I remember one time, I was leaving to go play hockey, and, and he said, You know what? He's like, I'm on my way out the door, and he's like, You know, you might be the only one here that could appreciate this. Um, he goes, You know, when I was when I was drinking back in Chicago. You know, I've been known to, uh, you know, pop a few drinks with uh, Stan Makita of the uh, of the uh, Chicago Blackhawks, and as he knows, I'm a huge hockey fan, and that's like I would, he's he's, a, he's an enormous legend, and I was I was amazed. I was uh, I couldn't really pinpoint my amazement. I couldn't really identify if I was amazed because Michael was just a drinking buddy with you know an NHL All Star, or if it was because. It was Stan Makita, because that's kind of like the equivalent would be like, yeah, you know, when I got back in my drinking days, you know, I used to go pop a few down at the watering hole with, with Napoleon, <laughs> like the Pontius Pilate. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, anyways, you never cease to amaze me, Michael, and, and I, yeah, I'm sure you always will. And I know you're gonna like this thing because you're a tough son of a bitch. And uh, and uh, I mean, you're tougher than Stan Makita. <laughs> he stopped. He stopped dropping the gloves like halfway through his career. He was kind of a pussy, so I know. I got him licked. All right. All right. I'm gonna leave it to the next guy. You know I'm Irish. We're all liars. Who the fuck is Stan McKee? He's a Slovak. He's a legend. He's a legend. <laughs> I, did, I did have a drink with him once or twice. <laughs>
Just saying. You're the only guy that I've ever seen dressed up as a woman that have been so ugly that made me have feelings for B. Arthur. Hey, we said hands off. Anything goes, right? B. Arthur, your mom? <laughs> My first experience with Mr. Michael O'Dwyer was uh, I just moved out here from, yes, I am a Detroit fan, Owen 16 Lions. And uh, I was looking for that watering hole that is in so many corners of Detroit and I, where I didn't have to pay $15 for a drink, so $17 for a beer. And somebody turned me on to Tom Burns. I worked around the corners, uh, uh, the corner at a little place called uh, Calendars, and stopped by one night. Decided to pop my head in and have a drink. Sit down at the bar, and I'm like, "This place is kind of cool." I just walked into some place out of Detroit. Up walks this old man. <laughs> He says, what are you drinking? I said, uh. He turned around and walked away. All right. And we're off to the races. Comes back a few minutes later. He's like, what are you having? So I tell him, you know, beer and a shot. We go on throughout the night. It's late in the evening, and it's getting close to closing time, and I see people starting to light up cigarettes. Now this is 2000. Smoking ban is in effect. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This is one of those bars in LA that I've heard about. People still smoke in bars. So I said, I said, excuse me, sir. He comes over and I said, I said, is, is this one of those places that I've heard about? You can still smoke in bars in here. He looks around. We usually only let this happen for regulars. <laughs> Are you gonna be a regular? <laughs> sure as shit. <laughs> I don't smoke anymore, but that was always a good fun part of going to Bergen's is uh, the last smoke of the night. Um, Managing Michael. I was a manager at Tom Burgers for a few years. It's uh, pretty much, you can't manage Michael. You basically just show up and make sure that the place doesn't burn down. Which I can say, I am one of the managers that made sure didn't have happen. Is cash in the house? Got, uh, I always got stuck with managing on Monday Night Football, which was Michael's night. It was Michael and Charlie behind the bar, if anybody remembers Charlie. Um, and I always prayed every single week that Charlie's team would win. Because these guys would do, uh, Lisa would go out and she would buy t-shirts of all the NFL teams throughout the entire league, and every single Monday night, these guys would wear whoever the opposing teams were, and the person who won that evening, their shirt would get raffled off. Well, as we saw in the pre-show, the performance that we all got to see when Michael's team won. I wish I would never have seen that dance ever again in my life! It was always fun to see an old fat man try and climb up on top of the bar, <laughs> dance around, shake his ass, take a t-shirt off, rub it up his ass, and then hand it with a smile and a kiss to some victim out in the audience. <laughs> when Bergen's closed its doors, I was grateful because I thought, oh, thank God we never have to see Michael up on top of the bar ever again in our lives. Then all of a sudden, Bergen's opens his doors again, 
and Michael's still behind the bar. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the doors closed once again. It was very short-lived. From what I hear, there's supposed to be a reopening very soon. <laughs> Hopefully your fat old ass cannot get through the door. Yeah, so I want to say I have a ton of respect for Michael. He is a great, great gentleman. It was an honor working with you, sir. I learned many things from you. And I'm not going to say it's going to go the other way, but you know. Let's all give this man a big roast and let's send him on his way. Roy Singer, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic. Let me hit you with a few thank yous. People who have contributed here for tonight. Uh, Rocco's Pizza. In the house. Big Wines. Brandon B. Day for the Jambalaya. Michelle Tan for Booze from Young's Market. And our enemy, Molly Malone's for beer. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the next roaster up. He is a professional commercial actor who does a little bit of detective work on the side. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. M Mr. M Mark Holgain. I got it. I got it. You got the name wrong, you fuck. <laughs> One uh, uh, person they forgot to mention that donated uh, to the night is Procter and Gamble for your depends, so you can see. <laughs> Drinking too much fucking water, you need to get to the head. Alright? Alright, just making sure. Dude. You want to take a break? Remember, I'm the last guy that talks. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I'll be gone before then. <laughs> Fuck, I'll be gone. Um, anyways, thank you all for being here tonight. You know, it was a surprise for me. They invited me. And uh, lo and behold, I found out that I was a roaster. I just thought there was fucking free booze tonight. <laughs> but uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark O'Gee, and I'm a detective for LAPD. And uh, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be clapping till your fucking cars get towed. Then you're all going to be saying shit. Then you're going to be pissed off. So let, let's save that till I'm gone. But about 13 years ago, uh, I made uh, Detective uh, after being in, uh, spending most of my life in South Los Angeles, and I get assigned to Wilshire Division, which is, uh, and uh, basically covers Tom Bergens. And <laughs> now, lo and behold, uh, I'm assigned to this cantankerous old fuck, not Michael, but uh, a gentleman by the name of Frank Bolin. <laughs> Of course, Michael, he said he wanted to be here today, too, but you know what? He's having problems with his Depends also. So, uh, so Frank and I, we're sitting there, we're talking, you know, police work, real intensive shit, and we're talking about where we're going to go drink after work. And he says, hey, we got to go to this place called Tom Bergen's. I've never been there. It was 13 years ago, you know, so I said, okay, let's go. And Frank says, okay, it's over here on uh, Fairfax, just south of Wilshire. And uh, well, as you know, Frank. And he says, but you can't get there before 5 o'clock. No matter what, don't get there before 5 o'clock. And I go, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? And so, my being a brand new detective, hey, detective work, my suspicion is uh, aroused. So, you know what? I, I, I get there. I get there fucking early. <laughs> And I walk in at four. And there I walk in and I see Frank Bowen. <laughs> who many of
of you confused with the fucking stool in the place? <laughs> I see Chris. I see TK. Uh, and I see Mike. I go, motherfucker, I walked into the Shady Hills old folks home. <laughs> say, <"Same> bar. <laughs> and then I get really worried. Because this motherfucker's wearing a dress. <laughs> but he's dancing cheek to cheek with TK. <laughs> to the sound of fly me to the moon. <laughs> Ugly picture. <laughs> and I was an impressionable young man at the time. <laughs> well, the song of the jukebox changed. So I sit down and I, I'm figuring I'm going to have a beer because they told me he was the bartender. So the song changes. He jumps out of the damn bar and he starts dancing around. Problem is, he passes right by me. And I made the mistake of looking up. <laughs> I've come to realize what they said. There ain't shit underneath that dress. <laughs> And I come to realize there's new meaning to the word of crusty old man. <laughs> so while I'm waiting for my beer, he jumps off the goddamn bar, and when he jumps off, the skirt lifts up again. It's like, just ugly. It's ugly. I was listening. I, I had visions of that old raisin commercial. <laughs> Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, those five cans you had, I had three. They're coming up. Yeah, you all right there? You sure? Okay. Because I ain't going to do that Heimlich on you. Well, I wait for him to order me a beer, and he looks at me, and, you know, as usual, in his cantankerous, old, crusty self, what do you want? So I'd say, you know, I can have a Guinness. What, well, don't you want a dose Eckies? <laughs> Just give me a beer. <laughs> so after 13 years, I've come to realize that this, you know, of, of spending my time at Bergen's and probably a good portion of my paycheck, of which fucking TK's never bought me a beer, but... Uh, <laughs> Spending so much time there and, and, and having Michael behind the bar and serving me, I've come to realize that this cantankerous old crusty old fucker is just really a really a really an old old cantankerous old fucker. <laughs> when they asked me to do this, you know, I, Michael and I had many conversations throughout the years, and uh, you know, for those of you that jumped on his bio. That, that read his life history. It's kind of amazing. Uh, him saying that, you know what, if you didn't get a PhD in smart ass till you were in the sixth grade, that, that's pretty amazing considering this fucker never got past the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm kind of proud because, you know, he said he enlisted in the army too. You know, for those of us that are veterans, that's outstanding. So who'd you serve with, the North or the South? <laughs> Salvation. <laughs> yeah, Quant yeah, Quantrill was a motherfucker, wasn't he? <laughs> but uh, throughout the time, you know, with Frank saying that, I mean, I'm sorry, Frank, I get you two mixed up. It's just, uh, you know, oh. Guy, you're one of the same. But with uh, Michael here saying that, uh, you know, he ran away, <laughs> and then they sent him back, they didn't take him back. It was like, please, that's the reason why he ran away again. <laughs> I wouldn't, and being born between two sisters, <laughs> that was a hell of a birth. What, somebody please remind me of that. <laughs> they got to fill me in on that one. <laughs> Later. But I'm going to keep mine brief. Uh, 
<laughs> because I came here with the full expectations of you being sick and not even going to say a goddamn thing. <laughs> and that kind of threw things off. But everybody here, we're here for a purpose. We're here because we love you. Yeah. Yay. And I do hope that uh, come 1 December that uh, you can pour me a beer again. Yes. Go Secchi. Go Secchi. <laughs> hey, at least your Spanish has improved. <laughs> but, like, but like I said, when we all uh, hit our knees tonight, people, no matter how crazy or, or as much as we want to uh, roast this um, <laughs> no, I was going to say beef jerky, but uh, if you want to say a little fart, that's okay. But when we hit your news tonight, do say, uh, put them in your prayers. Yes. So, no. Detective Mark Holgay, ladies and gentlemen. For the auction this evening, and um, we have Lee Cherry for videotaping the evening. Yes! yes. Yeah. Julie Slater for the music. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Frank Bowen and Kristen Larson for desserts. Yeah. Thank you very much, now, we have cousin Tom. We do. Yep. Fantastic. I don't know much about you, Tom, but I know you're not two-faced. If you were, you wouldn't bring that face with you. <laughs> Thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> Is he somebody important in here, Bill? Not to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I can say anything I want about him, right, Bill? Anyhow. Uh, sorry for my back to the audience there, but I'm speaking to Bill. He can't hear too well, so I have to face him when I talk to him. Uh, I'm uh, Bill's first cousin, but uh, more important than being his first cousin, I'm his double first cousin. For all of you who don't know that, uh, our fathers were brothers and our mothers were sisters. So we have very thick blood, very thick Irish blood. Now, when uh, I heard all these comments about Bill, I thought it was going to all be, you know, sort of nice things. And if I got up and said anything even negative or semi-derogatory, I'd be off limits. I can see there are no limits. <laughs> these people really know you, Bill. They know. They they know you how bad you really are. <laughs> But I'm here to give you the background as to how Bill got so bad. Uh, you, you heard of Peck's bad boy. Well, Billy is Billy's bad boy. And that's what he was known as growing up on the west side of Chicago. Now, he and I, we only lived about a mile apart at one time. And then later on, closer than that, only three or four blocks apart. And it was um, very uh, normal for us to be uh, converting together, parties, family parties, and so forth and so on. But we had a third cousin, and he was just a little bit older than me. Bill is the youngest, I'm in the middle, and this older cousin was only about five or six months older than all of us. And any time that I would um, talk to Billy, Billy would say, his to our, about our other cousin, Jerry O'Brien, he'd say, you don't like him, do you, Tom? I, you like me better than him, don't you, Tom? And I'd say, oh, of course, Bill. You're more interesting and you're more fun. Of course I like you, Bill. And of course, when I talked to Jerry O'Brien, Jerry would say, uh, you like me better than Bill, don't you, Tom? Uh, Tom? You know, that Bill, my mother and dad, they won't, they really don't want me to be around him because he's nothing but trouble. And I said, you're right, uh, Jerry, he is trouble. 
And there's three things we knew about Bill growing up. And one is, if you were with Bill long enough, he would talk you into getting into trouble. <laughs> and number two, after you got in trouble, you'd always get caught. But the third thing was, and the beauty of it all, Bill would always get the blame. And that was the beauty of it all, because they all knew that Bill was a troublemaker in the family. <laughs> now, on the west side of Chicago, he was known as early as fifth or sixth grade in life as the um, runaway king. He had it down pat. Now, I'm probably stealing one of his lines, but his mother and dad used to wrap his, wrap his lunch in Rand McNally naps. naps. <laughs> They were so used to him taking off and going to wherever else he fell, they figured, well, let's give him a head start. <laughs> and then they first started circling the map and putting destinations on there. <laughs> and on the map, it got further and further away from Chicago, thinking the farther he's away, the sooner or later he'll come back and maybe we won't see him. <laughs> so on one of his trips, he uh, decides, well, I got relatives in Dallas, Texas. Now, these were people that were born and raised in Chicago. And uh, the father and mother, that would be our aunt and uncle. And uh, they soon became uh, southern gentry. And they were quite well to do. Well, Bill decided that that's where I'm going to go. When he got there, of course, nobody was home. That didn't bother Bill. He knew how to get in every house. He was one of the phantom burglars on the west side. And that's another story. But Bill, Bill got into the house, and of course, when the family got home, they find him sleeping in his cousin's bed. So where the hell did he come from? Well, they finally, it took him about 24 hours to give him a few meals and put him on a plane and send him home. But they, that was his, his uh, travels. He was a thumb uh, rail guy with a big thumb. He knew how to get around the country all the way. Uh, another thing about the phantom burglars, Bill was only, uh, I think, sixth or seventh grade. And they had this local newspaper advertising all these people getting burglarized. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, if I got the title right, the phantom burglars? Uh, I thought so. <laughs> And they couldn't figure out. Well, they found out it was all these fifth and sixth graders breaking in all these houses and stealing whatever they could. Now, how they got caught and how they never ended up in prison, I don't know. Uh, but that was just another one of his, uh, his episodes in life. <laughs> Let's see. Back to the story about his schooling. <laughs> when you said he, he didn't get past sixth grade. Well, Bill and I went to separate grammar schools, but we ended up in the same high school. And then needless to say, because of our, you know, our um, uh, names, we were uh, lockers, not locker mates, but we were lockers next to each other. And it was very common for somebody to walk up to me at any given day and say, um, is Bill going to be here today? Uh, or where's Bill? And I say, what am I supposed to know? Try the locker. The locker's locked. Well, maybe he's inside. Now, where's Bill? Uh, finally, I said to one party, I said, look, at, if you want to know where Bill is, ask his mother and dad, because they don't even know where he's at. <laughs> and uh, one day, carry it, carry it on with his burglar stories. We went to a party at his house, and I was going to the seminary at the time, and I didn't much care for parties, so I came home early, and my sister and her friends were having a few beers in the living room, so I went to bed. About an hour later, my sister comes up, and she's shaking the living daylights out of me to wake me up. She said, somebody's breaking in our house. I said, what? Somebody's breaking in our house. Listen. And I'm listening, and it could hear a rap rap on our basement window. Then about two minutes later, 
rap, rap on the next basement window. I said, call a place, call a place. So I run down on my jockey shorts in front of all these three women. I'm going to be the hero of this whole thing. And I'm standing by the basement door on the first floor, waiting for the burglar to come through the basement window. And I'm going to hit him over the head with this ginger ale bottle. <laughs> Thank God the police showed up. We run to the front door, I open the door, and there's the police, and I said, get that guy, get him, look him. Billy's looking up at a straw hat, mumbling after being dry. He says, Tom, Tom, it's just me. I says, what the shit, what are you doing? He says, oh, I just wanted to get in the house. I said, why didn't you ring the fucking doorbell? He said, I was just practicing to be a burglar again. <laughs> Yes, I'm cut off. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you. On behalf of all of Bill's family from Chicago Park in the confines, thank you very much for all the hard work you put in for this man. We love him dearly, and thank you for the love that you have shown him. Massachusetts. He's a graduate of Holy Cross, Latin Greek scholar, been an officer in the Navy in Korea. He was about six foot four, and there was myself in the middle, and there was Dwyer, who was about five foot six then, had been a chef in Korea. So we all ended up together, and we needed a place to live. We had all just kind of appeared in New York to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So we got together, and we went out, and we started walking up the west side, you walk up the west side and go down to 68, 69, said, looking for an apartment that we could afford when we put it all together. And we're walking along, and there's, there's O'Connell, 6'4, there's myself, and there's Dwyer. And we're walking along, and Dwyer says, Well, you know, at least we can wear one another's clothes. <laughs> I'll finish it. The, at, at one point, we were all trying to find work. So I heard about it, and I went down, and I took the civil service exam to, to sort mail at Christmas in, in uh, New York City. And uh, they got a hold of it, and they said, gee, that sounds pretty good. So they went down, O'Connell, who was a you know, Holy Cross graduate, and Bill, who we had, uh, it's been reported, only got through the sixth grade. <laughs> So they all took it, and we got, we all passed. And uh, I expected to do, I got a 79 in the exam, and I thought that was about fair. And O'Connell, who was a Latin Greek scholar, he got, a, he got an 81. And for Bill, Bill gets an 85. And we never could figure that out. Obviously, the exam had nothing to do with common sense. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next up, his name is Mike Amber Alert Bunin. <laughs> Close friend of Michael's from 
<laughs> on my boys? Okay, that's close enough. Michael Buren, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the lovely nickname. Uh, this is an older crowd that I'm used to talking to. Based on my nickname. I get to follow M. M. at Walsh, by the way. The guy's a fucking legend. Top shot, Popa Greenwich Village. Played an Irish cop in Popa Greenwich Village. Not much, of a, not much of a stretch for Walsh, but that's fine. Do what you could. Um, hello, Michael Hoy. Nice to see you, my friend. When they asked me to come up uh, and say a few words for my friend over at Tom Bergen's, I said, I'm excited. Um, it's an honor, but is it going to be here? Because didn't you move to New York? And they said, no, that's Joe Burns. <laughs> and I said, oh, I said, well, who are we? And they said, Michael Dwyer. I said, Michael Dwyer? Said, yeah, he's a mediocre actor, works behind the bar. <laughs> I said, oh, jo I said, no, it's Johnny Galecki from the Big Bang Theory. He said, no, 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 there's more than one mediocre actor in LA. <laughs> and so I said, uh, I said, oh, Michael Dwyer, yeah, 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 let me go on his IMDb so I can look up. I must not update that page on that. So I said, oh, Michael Dwyer, sure, 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 sure. I know who we're talking about, one of my favorite guys, of course. So Mike is like, uh, I mean, when I first met Mike, in my opinion, he should be a scientist. Like, he's a white lab coat away from being a scientist. Like, nowadays, you can, you can order a DNA test online for $300 and send you your saliva, and they'll tell you their ethnicity. Or you can order a drink from Mike, and in 30 seconds, he'll tell you your ethnicity. <laughs> When I first walked in the bar in 97, he said, what can I get you? I said, well, uh, Jameson Rocks. And he said, you're Italian, right? <laughs> I'm very happy. I said, yes, I am. He goes, okay, Greece. <laughs> Surprised you're not ordering the cheap stuff. I said, well, why would you say that? He says, what, are you trying to hide the fact that you're half a Jew? He's like, oh, maybe it's not a white lab coat. Maybe it's a white... I've been coming in the bar and getting all sorts of life advice like, shut the fuck up, Grease. <laughs> Why is this girl with you? <laughs> she never waited until she went to the bathroom. Just sitting right in front of her. <laughs> She's fine. I mean, I'm running uphill anyways, but I got this mid midget fucking outdoing me in the bar. <laughs> I mean, the guy looks like David Jansen and Robert Culp had a kid. That's such an old reference that only Emma Walsh is gonna fucking get. Maybe I should have said Vincent Gardenia. Fuck it, I'm not roasting you people, I'm roasting him. Go fuck yourself, that's my joke. It's in the line. When they did ask me, I thought, like, sincerely, you know, what's a good toast for this guy? And I thought, well, I've worked with him. Uh, we a little TV together, we did a short film together. For the short film, they needed a, a degenerate horse player, and I said, it's a long shot. I might know somebody that's done the homework. But uh, I thought, like, sincerely, what would I say about Mike? I mean, you're talking handsome, talented, friendly. Which are not words I would use to describe my career. <laughs> then I thought, well, you know, average looking, faint of height, creepy. <laughs> you know, these are, these are words that I would use to describe them. 
I love you, Mike. <laughs> Um, in all sincerity, uh, Mike is everything, in my opinion, uh, that a friend and a bartender is supposed to be. He's somebody that when you come in, uh, the time is jovial. If you are using the quintessential bartender, you are going to get the life advice that you need. And at all costs, if, he's a, if you're in trouble, he's a guy who's not shy about reaching in his pocket to help, help you out. So I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to say, please raise a drink if you have one. For a guy that I genuinely love and I consider a very close friend, and I'm proud to be able to say that. Mr. Michael Black, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mike Buna, ladies and gentlemen. Next up, the announcer for Eric Gilliland. <laughs> some fucking reason he needs an announcer. Jesus Christ. Anyway, the announcer. According to his girlfriend, he has Bell's palsy of the dick. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a doctor, I don't really know. Um, please welcome the gentleman farmer, Johnny Galecki! Hey guys, uh, first of all, give yourselves a hand for spending the night to honor this wonderful event. Uh, I've had B. Arthur and Michael's better. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to take too long because uh, y'all know Michael a lot uh, better than I do, but uh, I know Michael from going to Bergen's because my buddy Eric would always suggest that we would meet there and I'd be like, oh, really? All right, fine. I mean, I've, I've seen your fucking shamrock before, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, and I'd walk in and I'd try to get a beer or something and, and Michael would say, just, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, with, like, deep-rooted disappointment, like, more than my father ever had for me. And Wow, oh, good choice, Eric. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, and a, a hand for Mike Bunin, please. Uh, uh, I've known Mike a very long time, and, 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 and Mike is such a big douchebag. How big a douchebag is he? I don't really. Have, uh, I don't have a joke for that. I just want to hear it. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Eric Gilland, and, and, and again, um, you know, you were, you were always so mean to me, but you were mean to me at, uh, you were, I did, you were mean to me at the, like, a, like an emotional ninja. You knew when, uh, when people were being too nice to me, and, and Michael always uh, drilled into my heart, and, and uh, thank you so much. So, uh, my friend, uh, Eric Gilland. at all. He <laughs> mentioned me at once. Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. He wrote a whole list I was supposed to read. Uh, 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 Scribe Fantasia was one of them. Uh, that he warmed your heart uh, while running for uh, Who's the Boss? Uh, uh, and, and Alyssa Milano would be nothing without him. Uh, proof is evident. Uh, our, our friend Eric <laughs> Happy go lucky, Johnny go lucky. Uh, I don't know why I'm the last one, this is crazy. Um, how do you roast my fellow Dwyer? How do you roast a man of such character? How do you roast a man who says, what the fuck are you doing here? Every time you walk into the bar. And I mean every time I go to the bathroom, come back into the bar, what the fuck are you doing here? Sweet man. And for, let, me, let me clear one thing up. Excuse me, where's the O come from, the O Dwyer? That's just appeared. And why are you Bill? <laughs> I really pray when I finally get that fucking mic. <laughs> then I'll be brief. <laughs> I started going to Bergen's. I, I didn't memorize it. Are you fucking kidding me? For you? Um, I started coming to Bergen's uh, even before Michael started working there. God, it was such a pleasant place back then. 
Everyone, uh, you got them. We joke around, got to know each other a little bit. Uh, and I came in wearing a t-shirt that had my hometown, Glenview, Illinois, written on it. And Michael said, Glenview, Illinois? Which shocked me because I never took him to be much of a reader. <laughs> uh, and it turns out his cousin owned the bar that was five blocks from where I grew up, Grandpa's. Um, the bar I threw up in on my 31st birthday. And 31st and 41st. Don't get it, find the guy. I'll go back and clean it up later. Uh, in fact, Michael said he often stayed in the attic above the bar. Attic? Addict? Coincidence? You just add DT. DT, you still have those, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Hearing Michael had cancer uh, was devastating, so I really felt sorry for the cancer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's give a round of applause to everyone who put this thing together. Yeah. Very cool. They, um, they told me to pull no punches and to don't go longer than three minutes which is the first thing he ever whispered in my ear. <laughs> I, used to come, I used to come to Bergen's a lot with my friend Matthew Perry. He used to come in a lot. And um, Matthew, you might know, has had some substance abuse problems. Well, I have a note from him. <laughs> uh, Dear Michael, thanks a fucking lot, Matthew. <laughs> It was lovely to see Michael on the cover of uh, Enabler magazine. <laughs> Stupid joke. Uh, I'm a TV writer and producer. Uh, we've done, worked on some shows together. Uh, and I brought some clips in for you, but he wasn't that good in them, so <laughs> I'm going to spare you. Though in fairness, you might have heard of his Cox performance in Oh Brother Where Art Thou? His cox performance in Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Where's his cock is the meaning of that joke? <laughs> Professional comedy writer. <laughs> I think of Michael sort of as a father figure. My father molested me when I was six. <laughs> and seven. And eight. He took nine off, but that's when my sister was born, so we're busy. And then right back into 10 and 11, and now it's like a Christmas tradition. I gotta get off the stooge. Uh, I love Michael O'Dwyer. I really, O'Dwyer, what the fuck. Um, he's one of my favorite, favorite people in the world. I live in New York now, when I come to Los Angeles, I. I see like only a couple people to make a point of seeing. One is Johnny Galecki, because he's done very well and he buys dinner a lot. <laughs> that was before I saw this hat. <laughs> I thought you said before I saw your sack. <laughs> that too. That boing. Uh, yes, okay, and um, and I go to to see to see Michael. Um, who was one of my favorite people ever invented. Um, uh, where, where am I? But no, no, don't call it a pause. <laughs> Thank you, fuck you. I don't even know you.
I wrote a note too. Oh no, it's not gonna work. I didn't set up right. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> for making this night happen. Thank you fucking millions. You've done a fantastic job. Southern Wines, thank you for getting us drunk. Mr. Larry Welk and Angel City Air. Derek Bell for the helicopter. We have a helicopter wine offering this evening. We will be auctioning it after the end of this evening. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, we're taking this opportunity to take the energy down a little bit. <laughs> Shut up to fuck. <laughs> There's one thing that Michael asked for. It's dear to him. So please, respect him's wisdom. Who's talking to him? Shut the fuck up, whoever you are. We'll <laughs> <laughs> see you after the show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. It's one thing that Michael asked for, which, it, <laughs> which is just a moment of silence. He would like to know what it feels like when he's dead. <laughs> if you could give me 60 seconds of your time, he can experience what will happen on ESPN, on the networks. One minute of silence. I'm going to count down from five, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to move across the stage. Please respect Michael O'Dwyer. <laughs> Down from five. Five. Four. Three. <laughs>
insulted people. I know who are who. Greeted <laughs> everybody with, hi, how are you? Welcome to Burger. What can I do for you? I'll be your wonderful bartender. <laughs> Before I go any further, though, I got Tom O'Leary, get out here. Tom O'Leary, get out here. Get out here, Tom O'Leary. God damn it, get out here. He's one of the true Irishmen here. Yeah. I know it's about time you can't be without it for five fucking minutes. <laughs> when, I, when I first met Tom O'Leary in March of 202 years ago, he uh, didn't want to introduce me to his wife, and I understood Siobhan, beautiful lady. Good fucking reason. Yes, very good reason. And, uh, and uh, I didn't meet her for about a month, so that had been April or May of 2011. And how old is Anna now? The baby? How old is Anna? It's five months. Five months, let's say so. We want to come <laughs> She was quite taken with me, she said. I, 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 asked, I asked Siobhan, that's, that's a real funny name, it doesn't even sound like it looks. But, you are a lovely lady, and uh, do you like older men? And then I looked at Tom, I said, what silly fucking question. <laughs> and so, you know, she got pregnant. <laughs> Any chance we can start this fucking roast over again? No. <laughs> anyway, just in case there was any doubt, I got a little specimen. You might want to have that joke. <laughs> anyway, maybe some of your wishes for all. There's nothing in it. I, I haven't put anything in anywhere, anywhere. <laughs> now I got this answer thing, I'm very unlikely to be doing it. In the near future. Jesus Christ. It was a great roast, wasn't it? Some of these guys. Yeah. 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 And Jeff Perry. He laughed all the time, but a lot of idiots do. <laughs> I saw him smiles on his face, but you never saw him say something funny. Who the fuck is Stan Makita? <laughs> I used to have a drink with him. I ran into him and played at different places, and I had a drink, and I told him, and I said, how can anybody like any sport so much he can be in awe of a guy that hasn't played for 30 years? <laughs> and just because I had a drink with him, he's impressed. <laughs> that shows you how. Shallow he is. <laughs> and then Carl, Carl, amazing. Yeah. There's a man, there's a man who I know from the day I met him to, the, to tonight, including tonight, never had shit to say. <laughs> he shit a mouthful tonight. I thought you were uh, mute and you just hung around with that, <laughs> that lady to make babies. <laughs> that's what she told me. <laughs> I never wanted to use that line, that's what she said. <laughs> Years ago when I first got out here, I hung around with a fellow named Pat McCormick. And I'm not dropping names. Uh -huh. I know all the heavyweights, I know all the heavy John, Matthew Perry, Johnny Gillette, I didn't know the heavyweight. <laughs> Michael Buhlman, can, can I ship my pants? Can I ship my pants? Can I ship my pants? <laughs> I know, I know a few, but Pat McCormick was one of the quickest wits I've ever, ever, ever known. It was like, just stuff came off the top of his head. I called him one night, and uh, Arthur Lowe had just died. And he called his answering machine and he said, Arthur, uh, Arthur Lowe is not in now. He'll have They'll have seat, uh, seatings at 12, 4, 20, and 6 o'clock. Yeah. What, what's that all about? He said, oh, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Those are his shoulders. <laughs> the, 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 the man was just funny. Herbie Velasquez is walking through a bar one day, and we're sitting at this uh, Italian restaurant, and he just picks him up out of nowhere. He says, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> he was the quickest wit I ever knew. And he told me, he said, that I got invited to do this story, to do this uh, uh, invocation or uh, show for all people had uh, disabled children. And uh, so he, he goes up on the thing and he tells his story. He said there was a couple who had a child, and his, his, name, his name was Jimmy. The thing was, he was a perfect head, but he had no body. <laughs> perfect head. <laughs> Years. They're, they're a 
attached to every uh, uh, ER in the whole country. If, if there's a, a child who gets killed, there's going to be a, a, a transplant, a head transplant. <laughs> <laughs> so this goes on year after year after year, and they come home one night and they say, Oh, Jimmy, there's Jimmy laying on his pillow, beautiful as ever, just the most beautiful child. <laughs> and he says, they said, Jimmy, 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 tomorrow's your birthday. You're going to have the, the most wonderful 12th birthday you could, uh, oh, you could ever imagine. And Jimmy looks up and he says, not another fucking hat. <laughs> what else could he give Give you diamond studs for you. <laughs> anyway, he told a story that he said there was total silence. <laughs> These were all people with disabled children. <laughs> <laughs> and then they burst out, they realized what he was doing, just like me. I'm not playing his cancer card. Fuck that, I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> Couple songs, tell a few stories, a couple of jokes. But some of these loud mouths ran way over. <laughs> well, the ones that weren't so funny, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, uh, we got Gay Pick on my. Oh, the thing is, my name was William Michael Dwyer. I was born William Michael Dwyer. When I became an actor, it was already William Dwyer, so I couldn't use my name. Michael, it was my middle name. I took the O that they dropped in the ocean, Mr. Gilliland. They left that old wire, they got to Ellis Island, and they dropped the O in the ocean. I just picked it up and put it on my name. And it has a very little sound, Michael O. Dwyer. Michael O. Dwyer. So I'm never going to tell a story that is Irish. I, I go into the phony Irish bro. <laughs> because people like it. I don't care if you do, Gilliland. <laughs> now that you're getting next to that loudmouth broad behind you. <laughs> I wish this was a non-alcoholic drink. I could drink it. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, let's see. Well, let's start with this one. Okay, Mike, Mike is walking up the, down behind the, in front of the church, and uh, Patty comes up and he says, but what, uh, uh, what are you waiting for, uh, Mike? He said, well, he's in uh, Father O'Brien's in there. He always gives me too much penance. I said, I'm, I'm just going to wait. Oh, this is my child. Is that open? Yes, sir. I love it when they do stuff for me. <laughs> I love that one so much. <laughs> yeah. So he said, I'm, I'm going to wait for another priest. He said, well, there won't be another priest. O'Brien's on tonight. She says, you're stuck with him. So he goes in and he says, I'll oh, bless me, Father, for I send a... I had committed adultery and I did it with, uh, uh, you know, I know you told me I shouldn't, but I didn't use it. Father, Father Brian says, oh, was it, was it Mrs. Murphy? He said, no, it wasn't Mrs. Murphy. You know, how about uh, Mrs. O'Hara? No, we're talking O'Hara. And he said, oh, 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 I bet she was McNally. Miss McNally, she's a bit of a slut. <laughs> Mike says, geez, Father, he says, I'm not going to, even if you were to guess, I'm not going to tell you. He says, he's all right, three our fathers, three young Marys, make a good act of contraction. He goes outside and he says, and, 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 and Patty says, was he, uh, was he hard on you? He says, Jesus, he was great. He gave me three our fathers, three young Marys, and three really good leads. <laughs>
It literally was in that I, my cousin went to seminary, but I'm the one who actually became a priest. And the reason I did, I grew up in a town in Chicago, West Side, and my best friends were Marty Scanlon and Jimmy Walsh. And we were all in love with Annie Rooney. Andy Rooney? Annie. <laughs> Before the eyebrows, she was something. <laughs> Even with the eyebrows, it wasn't so bad either. You could have sex with him and have, have a snack put away in his eyebrows. <laughs> no. did, I, did I give you all the time you needed, you fuck? <laughs> we all were in love with Annie. Annie. Mommy. Lovely girl. Well, as we grew up, Turns out she was more in love with Jimmy Walsh than any of us, so she married him. And Jimmy and Annie, I hope I'm not ignoring this side. I can't see if there are people over there. Uh, Jimmy and Annie had seven children. And Jimmy gets in a car accident and he dies. And I, at that time, was in the seminary and decided to come out and marry her, but she wouldn't have me. She'd have Marty Scanlon. And Marty, a handsome lad, marries her. They have eight children. Now they've got 15 children. Oh, my God. No, I'm not mine. Ow. <laughs> Marty dies. Marty dies. Who? Tootie Beth, the young man. And I come out, I'm a Monsignor now, and I'm, I'm ready to come out of the uh, church and marry Annie and her, be a father to her 15 children. And then Annie dies. It's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny at all. Hmm. Hang around for the punchline. <laughs> Annie dies. Now we're at the funeral alone when I get these children. Fifteen. Boom, boom, boom. I'm standing in front at the casket. Mrs. Gallagher comes up. She says, oh, my senior. Oh, my senior Michael. Isn't it grand to know that they're together again? And I said, do you mean Annie and Jimmy or Annie and Marty? <laughs> he says, she said, I was thinking of her legs. <laughs> yes. And so I went back to meet Parrish. And, and he listened to, uh, listened to confessions to the boys. And, for a couple of weeks, every boy's coming and say, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. And I had sex with that Pussy Green. He's right. Who's Pussy Green? She's a girl in the new girl in the neighborhood. And uh, I get this from four or five of them. And then Sunday morning comes in, and uh, I hear this hush. And as a woman walks down the middle of the road, middle down of the aisle, she's got a Kelly Green dress, red hair. She makes Maureen O'Hare look plain. That's how beautiful she is. And she's got these green slippers on. And I turned to my altar boy and I said, tell me, uh, uh, something, is, is that pussy green? He says, uh, I think it's just a reflection from her slippers. <laughs> was the county of Cork. All the buildings were painted green. Sure, the Hudson looked just like the Shannon. Oh, how pure and how real it did seem. I could hear mother singing, sweet Shannon bells ringing. Twas only an Irish man's dream.
You know, you know, you're going to sit on my thing later. <laughs> you're going to pay for all that shit. <laughs> just another greasy cop. Yeah, Snakey's my ass. <laughs> anyway, I want quiet. I want quiet and I demand it. <laughs> I have cancer. <laughs> I'm writing a book. My autobiography is, is going to be my apocryphal life. <laughs> because every story I tell you has some truth to it. And some you can dissect and say, oh, that might be true, that might not. <laughs> this is a true story, true and true. A tent bar in a place called the Bullmish in Chicago. It was a great bar. It had all kinds of interesting <coughs> people. Mike Royko used to be in there. He was one Saturday night talking with a couple other newspaper men. We're talking about Nixon. I'm behind the bar. And there, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. there's nobody else in the bar, so it's 5.30, 6 o'clock, uh, fall night, and uh, the lady comes in, and I said, it's, it's, it's just like a Western, everything went quiet. She comes in, she looks like, oh, you would imagine Audrey Hepburn in her 40s, just class act, period. And she comes, sits down at the bar, and I walk over her, and I say, hi, how you doing? And she says, I'm fine, what's your name? I said, Michael. She says, Michael. I want a tangare martini up. I want it chilled. I'm really cold. And she says, you've been a bartender a bit. And I said, yes. She says, I know you're going to not disappoint me. And I said, OK, I'll try not to. And I showed the glass, and I poured the tangare. Just, she says, oh, just a whisper. And I picked up the bottle, and I said, bye. <laughs> Down. Uh, yeah. I said, that was with a twist. She says, yes, I give it to her. I put it in front of her. She goes, up. Oh. Oh, Michael, you do not disappoint. <laughs> and with that, the guys start yapping again, yapping, yapping, and a little, not loud, but just enough. She picks up on their conversation. They're talking about Nixon, what a prick he was, and what a jerk, and yada, yada, yada. And she says, and by now she's finished her drink. She's finished the drink, and she had taken her gloves off. She's putting on her gloves, and she starts to get up. She said, I would like to say one thing about that man. And everybody has everybody's attention. And look at this drop-dead gorgeous woman with so much class. And she's going to, has an announcement to make. I hate that man. He tried to do to this country what pantyhose did for finger fucking. <laughs> I almost dropped the glasses. She puts her up around the club and she starts to walk and she says, I'll see you again, Michael. <laughs> I said, oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> and three weeks later, I run into her. I'm walking into a bar uh, about 6 o'clock in the evening to uh, hang with my friend Chick. And she comes in and sits down a couple of stools away from me. And I said, Chick, tangerine martini, chill. No vermouth, just a whisper of vermouth and a twist. And I said, put it on my tab. She looked over and I said, Barbara, right? If my, she even told me her name. And she says, yes. And she came and they got the drink and took a sip. She says, that's quite good. Thank you, Chip. And she looked at me and she said, <laughs> And she said, Michael, do you live close to her? I said, I live about a mile from here. She says, I only live two blocks. <laughs> and an hour later, <laughs> she said those five words that I've savored all my life since then. She says, Michael, you do not disappoint. <laughs>